A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. We are recording this on Wednesday, March 23rd, 2022. I have two amazing guests this week. It's unbelievable. It's like an all-star lineup here. We have Luis Bolaños, my friend, friend of the show, a former homicide detective with 30 years of law enforcement experience who now runs his own private investigation agency called Get Bit. And Lewis, of course, dedicates a lot of his free time to helping people, victims, survivors. You're just just a wonderful resource. Lewis, welcome back. Hi, Anna. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. And I'm really excited about an opportunity to speak about uh, with Kobe Webb and for your subscribers and our viewers to to learn about her and see what a powerhouse she is. Oh, she's um, amazing. And, and Lewis amazing is referring yes. to, to our special guest who's going to be joining us on the second case. We're talking about Dr. Kobe Webb. She's a remarkable woman, unbelievable. A former captain in the Riverside County Sheriff's Department. She created the Bloodhound Unit there and at other departments across the country. She's an internationally recognized canine bloodhound trainer, but that's not all. She nearly died in a car accident with her babies in the car and she was left partially paralyzed. Now what she does is she takes service dogs that don't make the cut she gives them a new job, a new place, and she's placing these dogs all over the country at police departments to help victims of crime, to help the officers get through traumatic times. Her story is unbelievable. Um, she's just amazing. She's just amazing. And, and please, I hope you stick around to hear Dr. Kobe Webb's story because it's fantastic. So these are our cases this week. The body of a missing Michigan woman has just been found. Her accused killer decided on day two of his murder trial that maybe a plea deal would be a good idea. And as part of that deal, he had to take authorities to where he buried a mother of two. So two years later, the remains of this woman we believe have now been found in a shallow grave. But first, this story, as crazy as they come, I'm telling you, buckle your seatbelts because we're on the crazy train. A man who concealed himself by wearing a scuba diving suit has finally been sentenced for kidnapping and sexually assaulting a California woman. At first, police did not believe the woman's story because the story was so outrageous. The things that she said happened to her and her boyfriend and that the man was wearing this scuba diving suit when he broke into their apartment and the things that he did and the way the story, I mean, police didn't believe her, didn't believe him. They actually said publicly, this is a hoax and they are wasting our time and taxpayer money and they are wasting the time of the police where we could be helping real victims and the entire time they really were the victims. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's an understatement. Yeah. I, I've never seen anything like this where the police come out very quickly and, and label this couple, this couple of those victimized, terrorized as committing a hoax. And you imagine all that in what that entails and not oh. just to the public and, and their perception of this couple, but what they're feeling hearing this is just traumatized, traumatizing on top of traumatizing. Uh, it's an incredible story. Right. So police in Northern California, this is the community of Vallejo, um, they call this a hoax. And of course, it turns out that the assailant, oh yeah, he was a Harvard-educated Marine. Hello? Okay? Okay? So Matthew Muller, he just pleaded no contest to two counts of forcible rape, robbery, burglary, and false imprisonment in connection with the kidnapping of Denise Huskins. Now, Vallejo police initially believed that Denise Huskins had faked her own kidnapping, publicly hinting it was a hoax due to the bizarre details of the case. So let's talk about the details because they're so incredible. I mean, I, 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 I've never heard of anything like this. So the crime happened in March of 2015. According to Denise, 
an armed man wearing a scuba suit burst into her boyfriend's apartment at 3 a.m., her then-boyfriend, Aaron Quinn. The two worked as physical therapists together. So according to the victims in this case, who survived, the attacker demanded that the couple get in the closet and then their hands and their feet were zip-tied, okay? Then, get this, this is so bizarre, Lewis, the, the intruder, the assailant, places blacked out swim goggles over their eyes and then forces them to drink a liquid which was a sleep inducing liquid they later police later found out it was one quarter of diazepam and nyquil mixed together okay yeah. right then they were threatened that their faces would be cut they would be given electric shocks if they didn't follow. Then this crazy man in the scuba suit puts headphones over them and makes them listen to a pre-recorded tape. This tape is insane. It says insane stuff, okay? Aaron, the boyfriend, described that he heard messages that said things like, uh, we are a professional group here to collect financial debts. Okay, you've just, I mean, None of this makes sense. It's like a crazy man talking and that they were going to take his ex fiance and that there would be cameras placed all in the house that he would be monitored if he didn't follow instructions that he must be confined to the living room, the kitchen bathroom. He would await further details. Oh my God, the attacker, Lewis. He took red tape and taped a portion of the living room floor off and said to the man, you cannot move outside of this taped area and that I have surveillance cameras everywhere watching you. And if you don't do what I say, I will kill her and you have to give me money. Oh, he asked for the passwords for all of his accounts, for the finances. He wanted $15,000 for the safe release of Denise. So can you imagine how disoriented this poor man was when he wakes up from this insanity and finds Denise missing and is himself thinking, what the hell just happened? Right. And, and part of uh, Mueller, Suspect Mueller's presentation to the couple, the, what he wanted to think also was that he was not there alone. He said, we are here. We, the, and he continues this throughout the early part of the investigation uh, through the days, making the victims think there are multiple suspects there. They thought there was more than one individual. He created an atmosphere, a presentation, so they would think that. Um, and he tried to carry that a little further down the road. As a yeah, he defense. created he created this virtual reality for them that was obviously very real. So when Aaron woke up and Denise was gone, he called the police. And when they arrive, they, of course, think that they're dealing with a guy who appears to like been, have been doing drugs all night. And they're just not believing this story. So he ends up being questioned by police. He gets questioned by the FBI. And, you know, two days well, we later... Just add to that. He gets questioned by the police, and, and it's on tape, the initial investigation, the initial uh, interview with him. And the detective is all over him, challenging him, saying, you're lying. Things aren't matching up with what you're saying. And basically letting him know that you are my prime suspect. And look, we all know we've talked about this on previous cases, right? You do have to look within first. You work your way out. Yeah? So it, I, I get questioning him and verifying what he's in telling you. But they never verified anything. Went, they went after him immediately, um, which was so wrong. But there'll be more on that later. And isn't it interesting, he also tried to reach his brother. His brother is a federal agent, you know. So, so here you have someone with family and law enforcement, and he's being treated this way as if he has done something to Denise. And I get it. You know, it's possible that he could have, right? I mean, we've seen and heard crazier things. Right. I, I don't, I don't, I understand challenging him. I get that. It's horrible, yes, because he ends up being the victim here. And at that moment in time, Denise must be found, right. right? One thing is clear, Denise is missing and we're not sure where she is or how she disappeared. Right. So uh, <laughs> this is unbelievable. So diving suit man, we're gonna call him that for right now. He sends an email to Aaron. Now remember, he, he asked for all of Aaron's passwords, email, bank accounts, all this stuff while he was drugging him. Um, he sends, uh, an email to Aaron and 
He includes an audio recording, which is a proof of life that Denise is alive. And it was so well encrypted, the police could not track it down or break it. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. yeah. That, but that, even that. then, police, right, didn't really believe this was true. Correct. They didn't believe it was true until later, t- until a hero stepped forward. And we'll talk about her a little more later. So let's, let's continue okay. because, I, honestly... This gets more bizarre. So now police have this audio recording that was sent to the boyfriend and they cannot find or trace it. Remember, Denise is still missing at the time. So this is all going on. So um, Denise, she claims, now she ultimately, she gets released two days later. We, we will get into that. But I just, I, I want to tell you that Denise claimed that she had been held by a group of men who sexually assaulted her. Remember what Lewis said? that he made it seem, Scuba Man made it seem like there were more people involved in all of this. And she was taken to South Lake Tahoe. She really was. So her abductor, right, drives her down to Huntington Beach down here in Southern California. And he releases her near her parents' house. So she like, she's disoriented. She gets left off. You know, she's walking down the street. She asks either the gardener or a neighbor or somebody, please, can I borrow your phone so I could call my dad? Kind of, right? Can you right. imagine this? Right. I, and I, I believe, I, I believe the day she returned is the same day that law enforcement, the police department, Malego PD, did their press conference announcing that it was a hoax. Mm. Crazy. Unbelievable. So here's this uh, woman, right? right. Completely disoriented. She's telling this crazy tale. It is crazy, but it's true. And so, um, you know, she finally gets to her parents. They get her to the police. And she tells the police that her attacker was a white man with brownish red hair. She said she didn't see the others, but she was allowed to shower and brush her teeth. So now you're like, okay, that's kind of weird. And, um, when he released her, so the police could see, he had taped her eyes shut and then put those goggles, those swim goggles that were blacked out over her eyes. So she had no idea where she had been, how she got there, but she, you know, this is how she gets released, right? And so she's telling the police all this. Now, this is interesting and will come back in a way to impact, I think, how authorities handled this. At first, she denied that she was sexually assaulted at the very first interview. Um, And then that ends up... Which is common. Yes. I wanted you to handle that. Law enforcement has to recognize that. That is common. So, uh, yes, she did deny it, but you have to get through that. Right. And she ultimately did tell the police in great detail what happened. She managed to get an attorney. And um, honestly, the turning point here is... um, Oh, and she described how she had been sexually assaulted by different men because that's what she thought. That's what she was being told. She didn't know it was the same guy, okay? Again, this woman is being held in a home. I I just imagine what those two days of her life have been like. So, okay. So then meanwhile, Aaron, you know, before she's uh, released, you know, he's he's trying to figure out how can I help her? How can I get her um, released? Anyway, she appears. Here's the amazing thing. As Lewis just said, the police, the Vallejo Police Department actually made a public statement, which was picked up by all the media. It was the biggest story ever. Hoax. Woman claimed she was kidnapped, um, boyfriend, drugged. All of this, they say, this is the quote from the police. Taking the focus away from true crime victims in our community. That's what they had done victimizing the victims Mm. okay now you're thinking how does this case break okay all right scuba man he is certifiably nuts okay what does he do scuba man sees the news and he is furious that anyone would dare to call his crime a hoax he gets so mad that he emails the san francisco chronicle and he even emails the police officer who made the statement about the hoax and threatened to harm him if he didn't apologize and take it back. And he gave 
And so he writes a manifesto, an email, right? Two emails to the San Francisco Chronicle. And in this manifesto, he gives details that were never made public that the only person who could know about would be the victims and the attacker. Yeah, because he's pissed off. They don't believe that uh, <laughs> that it was a hoax. They believe it was a hoax and they don't believe they're really victimized. So all his work did down, went down the drain. Yes. He wants credit for that kidnapping, for he's everything. Insane. Yeah, you know, the complaint, it's another F complaint written by an FBI agent, but some of his emails were four or five pages long. Uh, oh, it's, and yeah. you know, when you read them, if you all go down that rabbit hole and read them, I mean, it goes all over the place. It's yeah. it's the rantings of, of a crazy man, obviously, given all of this. But what is, to me, that is unbelievable is the fact that he came forward, still all encrypted in all of this, is now completely changing this investigation. Because now what the hell are police going to do now? Now we have a crazy guy who knows stuff he shouldn't know. Is he part of the hoax or is he really the attacker? Yeah. And, and oops, I think we may have spoke too soon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oof. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'd I mean, love to have heard those staff meetings. Oh, right? It's like... Yeah. You know, so-and-so, what the heck were you thinking going out there saying this? You know, now we have a man threatening you. Now we need to get you protection. <laughs> yeah, well, let's talk about that process. So you have the, the case investigator who's charged with leading this investigation early on to see if this is a, a kidnapping or not. And right away, he comes to a conclusion that it's a hoax. So how does it get to the level where there's a press conference? He has to go to his supervisor and pitch it to them and his team members. And they all have to go, yeah, you're right. Then they go to their supervisor and eventually, eventually gets to the sheriff or to the police chief, right? And and they pitch it to them. Okay, you're right. So the whole department, the, the checks and balances that are in place to prevent this, they don't. They fail and they back up with the, the beliefs of the initial investigator to the point where they want to do a press conference quickly. Unheard right. of. Unheard of, yeah. right? To stop it all. Makes more headlines. So now we have... We have Scuba Man, who's emailing everyone and, and adding everything he possibly can as proof that this isn't a hoax, that he really did do it. In fact, you know, when he mentioned that proof of life audio, I mean, that really cinched it because nobody knew about that. So he himself in his manifesto said that there was a group of kidnappers. This is how he wrote it. He said, more than two, but less than eight. <laughs> He what do you shut do up. this? He right. can't shut up. And and then he wrote, Denise was, quote, absolutely kidnapped. Like, how dare you challenge me? I went to Harvard, yeah. right? Yeah. Right? And I am a control freak. I'm in charge of this. And then, then Scuba Man writes that by not believing her, that the police have now victimized her again. Oh, my God. And Scuba Man actually wrote that by the police not believing that Denise had truly been kidnapped, that the police were victimizing her again, and he was upset about that, that she deserved better. This is a man who assaulted her and kidnaps her, but he's mad that the police are treating her badly. Yeah, this man raped her. Oh my God. This man is a freaking monster. Yeah. He is insane, he is a monster, he is despicable. He is despicable, and and then in his next email he wrote, he says, I'm deeply ashamed and regretful of our unforgivable con conduct. He says, our. He's the only one. He wasn't working with anybody, okay? okay. He, he's, still, he's still trying to mix truth with fiction to help further his, his goal here, which is get some kind of credit and to distance himself from this in case he gets caught, that there were others involved. And, and look, listen, talk to the victims. They'll tell you there were others. Right. Exactly, because that's, he, he just made up this fantasy situation. So while all of this is unfolding, and that is definitely a lot to absorb without question, you know, and I can't even imagine how the victims themselves must have felt, the survivors, as they're reading these crazy manifestos from the person who abducted them who is still out there. Right. right. So that to me is very, very frightening. Yeah. And they're thinking there's multiple suspects out yes, there. Yes. Not just exactly. him. They're, they have a reason to be concerned about their safety. They think at that time there's multiple suspects out there. Right. And we are not safe. And the police don't believe us. So they're certainly not going to protect us. So while all of this is going on, something else happens because this lunatic pulls this stunt 
again, okay? So another detective working on another case finds a similar home invasion. In this home invasion case nearby, the intruder breaks in, there's a couple living in the home, and the woman runs, locks herself in the bathroom, and she has her cell phone with her, and she calls 911. Meanwhile, her boyfriend or the husband, the man in the house, right, he's fighting off the attacker. All of a sudden, the attacker freaks out and runs away. What does he leave? He leaves his cell phone behind. The attacker leaves his cell phone behind. So this other investigator on the other case is like, geez, I wonder if these two are related. Cracks the cell phone, gets a search warrant. Everything starts coming together. The cell phone belongs to Matthew. They go to Matthew's mother's house and she's like, oh yeah, that's my son. Yeah, you know, he told me he lost his phone, uh, but he's up at our um, South Lake Tahoe house. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so let's, let's talk a little bit more about this other detective. This is a picture of her. Um, and I think people need to recognize that this young lady went above and beyond. And she's described, described as a pit bull investigator. She did everything right. And to this day, the victims will tell you if it wasn't for her, they feel they would have been incarcerated today. That it would have ended up being a wrongful prosecution and a wrongful conviction, and they would have been incarcerated today. But thanks to her, they're not. So she did everything right, and I can only imagine when it starts going ding, ding, ding for her, when she realizes what may have gone on here, speaking to her supervisor, going up the chain of command saying, I think I got this, I think they got it wrong. That PR that went out in that press conference accusing those two victims of, of, of manufacturing this thing as a hoax is wrong. So how do we want to break it to this other department? They got it wrong. I would love to follow that whole trail and oh see God. how they to be a fly on the wall right. on that one, right? Yeah, but when this detective, well done, detective, well done, right? Oh, yeah. she was amazing because not only does she get this information about Matthew's mother and the house, and then they start getting search warrants, they start tracking cars, everything, the property. So she's now amassing all this information about Matthew, right? And everything that she's finding is fitting in with Denise and Aaron's abduction, right? right. So <laughs> it, it's just, it's incredible. It's in, I mean, even the cell phone <laughs> triangulates. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, right? it does. Again, in, this, not in the, the place where she was held, I just, it's, it's, it's incredible. So the FBI managed to get access then to Matthew's car. And of course they got warrants for the car, for the house, for everything. And in the car, what do they find? They find a pair of swim goggles that had long blonde hair attached to it, which ultimately belonged to Denise. Yeah. Okay. The evidence starts coming in. They found more evidence at the Lake Tahoe house where Denise was held and sexually assaulted, right? Right. And when they, you know, he answers the door and and they find all sorts of weird things like these blank digital key makers. Is, do you think that's how he broke into the houses? I don't know about that you stuff. Know, it, it's, it's hard to say. He definitely did some homework because he has some very personal information. He was also an attorney in the state of California. He had a bar license. So I wanted to see a little more on that. And I just want to go through the timeline here. In May of 2011, he was admitted to the state bar. In December 23, two years later of 2013, an investigation by the state bar begins because he's accused of failing to perform with competence, failing to properly refund unearned funds, acts of moral turpitude, and failing to cooperate in a state bar investigation. Just months before the kidnapping, he is disbarred. Two months later, March 23rd, 2015, the kidnapping occurs. So his life has taken a, a, a dive, at least in his professional career. Who knows? I mean, this is a man, going. right? He went to Harvard, according to the FBI affidavit, that he yeah. uh, went to Harvard Law School. He apparently taught at Harvard. This is all according to the FBI. You know, so. Um, he, clearly a, a very intelligent, educated man, but 
But when police interviewed him, he said that um, he was a former Marine who had suffered from Gulf War psychosis. He claims that that is what caused all of these problems. I don't know. I'm not going to judge that. But he is one dangerous man. Yeah, no, no, no doubt about it. And look, of course, it may have had a, a be part of it. It could. How, how, how are we ever going to know for sure? Hard to feel sorry for the guy. Oh, my gosh. This guy. Well, even though it shouldn't I mean, happen to anybody, but no, absolutely wow. not. No, no, no. It's just that he's just he just says whatever, you know, he uh, he says whatever. So there is some justice in this case. Of course, this guy's locked up forever, but he's never going to be shut up. You know, and who knows if he's going to reach out to the survivors and continue to harass them. But as we have said over and over again, the Vallejo Police Department acted very badly here. And so there was a lawsuit. Who could blame Denise and Aaron for suing them? The settlement was $2.5 million, right? Yeah, not nearly, million enough, dollars. not nearly enough for what they went through. And there is a new police chief, and this police chief offered a public apology saying that what happened to them was horrific and evil. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. But there is truly some happiness and a happy ending here. This is the kind of stuff that I love, okay? Yeah. Just to show you the strength and the kindness of our two survivors, Denise and Aaron. They got married in 2018. But when they got married, who went to the wedding ceremony, Lewis? Your favorite detective. There she is. Yep. As she she, she was at their wedding, right? They will now, be friends for life. For life. They have a life because of her. Yeah. Isn't that lovely? I just love that, okay? I just love ending on that truly, truly happy visual of happy couple, happy family, happy baby, and the police officer who helped them and believed them. Yeah. So I leave you on that happy note, and we're going to take a quick break, quick little word here from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. If you struggle to figure out what to make for dinner each night, it might be time to check out HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers pre-portioned ingredients to your door, including farm fresh produce that arrives within a week. So you get the convenience without skimping on the quality. HelloFresh recipes are also really easy to follow and quick to make with steps and pictures to guide you along the way. And HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal of the very same quality. I am telling you, I'm so impressed with the quality of not only the meats, but the produce and then all the fixings, as they say, everything in tiny little like, you know, envelopes or little packaging, perfectly pre-portioned. So go to HelloFresh.com slash TCD16 and use the code TCD16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. That's HelloFresh.com slash TCD16 for True Crime Daily. Don't forget to use the code TCD16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Angie's list is now Angie, your home for everything home. With Angie, it is easy to tackle your projects from repair to remodel, landscaping to interior design. Just tell them what you need and Angie will handle the rest from start to finish or browse reviews, compare quotes from local pros and connect instantly. And when you pay through Angie, you get their happiness guarantee covering your project up to the full purchase price. So download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. Lewis, our next case proves that even when you have the accused murderer leading police to where he allegedly buried the body, you still need an assist from specially trained canines. This is exactly what happened in Michigan. This is two years after she disappeared. Authorities believe they have found the remains of 27-year-old Amber Griffin in a shallow grave. But Lewis, they had already charged the ex-boyfriend and he was, they had already started the murder trial when he decides to cooperate. Does that happen very often? 
Right. Well, a lot of times cases are successfully prosecuted, uh, including homicides based strictly on circumstantial evidence. It's always best to have the body. In this case, they didn't. So they went with what they had and they uh, came to the conclusion they had more than enough to, to get a, uh, a verdict, a guilty verdict at the end. So what's interesting is here's a little bit of the background. So Amber who was a mother of two, was reported missing by her own mother on June 24th of 2020. Her mother became suspicious when she received a troubling text, right? We've seen this before. The text is sent from the phone, but the person receiving it isn't so sure that it was sent by that person. And so, you know, so this was two nights earlier that she got the text. Now she's getting really, really worried. Six days after Amber vanished, her ex-boyfriend of five years, Derek Horton was arrested and charged with her murder. Police didn't have a body, but they said they found that enough evidence that suggested something horrible had happened to her. So apparently Derek became a person of interest after investigators discovered a 911 call made from Amber's phone at 2.01 in the morning on June 22nd of 2020. Apparently... Um, her phone had been turned off after that 911 call and they said they could hear things on the 911 call. Right. Is, right. is that, you know, and then they the found blood. The starts to go up, right? You start, things don't seem, seem uh, as somebody else wants it, you to, uh, wants it to appear. So I, look, and this is just a good police work from the beginning that they're not going straight to a conclusion. They're considering everything like we've seen in other cases um, where they don't and they funnel in in one direction um, and start to snowball in the wrong direction. Uh, so, no, I, I think that's uh, that's a tell. That's absolutely mm-hmm. a tell that you should look further and deeper. And apparently, as police are investigating everything, you know, the location of where the cell phone uh, call, the 911 call was made, apparently they could hear um, Amber and her you know, ex-boyfriend arguing, they could hear a struggle. Apparently there was, they were at a house party and that there was blood on, on the outside of Amber's car, inside of the car, all over the house in different places. And he explained it away to police by saying, oh yeah, she cut her hand on a liquor bottle. Right, right. And those statements turned into what uh, eventually became circumstantial evidence was one of the reasons they were able to continue with the prosecution. So police say that they also found a receipt from Mix Hardware for an $8 shovel, and that was purchased on the last day that Amber was seen alive. What do you find suspicious about that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, that's pretty telling in itself, right? Graves, shovels out in uh, unincorporated areas. But again, thank goodness, another suspect who's not quite the sharpest knife in the drawer, right? Mm -hmm. Leaving evidence like that behind. Uh, and if he de- uh, and if he were going to deny it and say, "Well, oh, yeah, I paid a, you know, I didn't do it," um, police say they found security video at the hardware store. Of course, they of- did. Yeah, of course, <laughs> right, of, right. of him buying the shovel. Before we get into more details about how they finally located Amber's remains and what transpired and the history between these two, uh, I want to bring on a special guest. This is Dr. Kobe Webb. A former, is it captain in the Riverside County Sheriff's Department? Is that correct, Kobe? Yes. Excellent. Now, Kobe has a unique skill set here. Um, she is internationally recognized as a canine bloodhound trainer. She also set up bloodhound units at several police departments across the country. And now she has developed tools for families to help them preserve the scent of their loved one in case, God forbid, they disappear or they are abducted. Think about it, having a good, fresh scent to help police find your loved one. And in addition to all of that that Kobe does, she has this wonderful program now where she is taking former service dogs, retraining them, and working with police departments, there you go, with the help of PAVE, um, organization that Lewis works with and helps with the funding for this, right? Yeah, CCPSD, Kobe Certified PAVE Support Dog. Um, it, it's an incredible program and I'll, I, I can't let Kobe explain it, but I just wanna add, right? So uh, let me tell you a little more about Kobe Webb, Dr. Kobe Webb. And I've told you this before, and you know that I, I have mentioned her, I'm a big fan of hers and I've been 
for years. And she's one of the first people that I started talking about years ago. You worked together and solved cases yeah, together. Absolutely. So my, my first recollection of Kobe was I was working in the city of Palm Desert uh, on a baby narcotics team. And Kobe walked into our bullpen, our office, and I, I think she relatively new investigator, or new deputy at the time. And she asked an open question to all of us who were pretty well seasoned uh, investigators at the time. Hey, I'm interested in learning about the canine program, right? I, want, I think I want to get my own bloodhound. I want to learn everything I can, the best way to bring this program to Riverside County. That was, I want to say, 30 years ago. Since that time, Kobe has went on to become one of the most renowned canine handlers, bloodhound experts, not just in the nation, but internationally. She is one of the top instructors. It's everybody go, everybody's go-to, every department's go-to is talk, speaking with Dr. Kobe Webb. So you have an extremely well, well background and versed and, and credited individual right here in Dr. Webb. And I just love calling her Dr. Webb. So if ever I need a kick in the pants to move forward and get passionate about something, and I think I'm having a bad day, I think about Kobe and her story. Right? Oh, that, my God. Wait till you powerful. all hear Kobe's story because Kobe nearly yeah. died, right? Kobe almost never made it to this point. So, And that's an incredible story of survival, which really dovetails into what she does now, uh, which is great. But I want to get everybody back on our case and why Dr. Kobe's here and, and kind of um, w we will talk more about your incredible background. I'm so glad that you're with us. So... Um, Kobe, what I find interesting in this particular case is that, so the, the accused murderer in this case on day two of the trial says, you know what? I'm going to take a deal. This is not going my way. Okay. He saw the light, but as part of the deal, prosecutor said, okay, buddy, there's only one way this deal is going to happen. We'll drop this down, you know, to second degree murder, but you have to, you must tell us where Amber is. You don't provide Amber's remains. This deal is off the table. So Kobe, here's my question for you. Here's a guy who is like supposedly going to lead police to where Amber's body is, but police bring in canines, cadaver dogs. Why would they do that? Well, there's a couple reasons. Um, sometimes um, people are not honest with law enforcement. They'll take you around to different areas um, just because. Uh, and then the second reason is we do want the dogs there because they're going to pinpoint. They're going to tell us if what they're telling us is true. And then we can preserve a crime scene before we bring in everybody, which could be equipment, um, excavators, anything to start um, searching for those remains without damaging them. So if we could bring in a dog, I mean, you're talking a 60 pound animal walking around and be able to source where that grave is, we are saving evidence. And for example, that could be a receipt, leggings, everything not destroyed by searchers. So would it have been an extra challenge here, the fact that the body, if if it if she were originally buried in this shallow grave and never moved, that you're dealing with the decomposition and and a grave which is now it, the, the body's two years old. How does that impact the ability of these cadaver dogs to find the 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 remains? Well, in this particular case, it was a rural area uh, where she it appeared where she had been buried. What kind of happens with that is over two years, you can have animals come and dig up and scatter remains. Things can happen, weather, everything. But these dogs are so well trained and tested that they can even look for blood. So a skeleton, could you imagine how much odor there is there with that? So it, it was really, whether they're buried like that, it does kind of help us rather than a shallow grave. Um, because we do worry about the animals taking, scattering, anything like that. But when it's buried down a little bit, it, that part's kind of nice in a way for the dogs uh, because it's hopefully intact. A stronger so, odor, one spot. Really? So she was three feet below. Does any of that matter? No, it depends usually on the dogs. We do have uh, probes that we can kind of dig into the dirt to kind of change some of 
allow scent to come out. But remember too, usually remains with the breakdown of the remains, the blood, all that goes into the soil. So the dogs can still smell that. Their nose is irreplaceable. And you give us an area, that's all we ask for when investigators call, give us an area to search. And we are just so appreciative because the dogs are that good. Interesting. Now, I, 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 I'm a real novice in this area. So can you just explain to me, there is a difference in the ability of the dog and the training if a, a scent dog versus a cadaver dog, they're not the same? Well, no. Basically, what it looks at is the level of the dog's training not necessarily the discipline. So for example, um, there are some cadaver dogs that are really exceptional. Uh, One is a retired FBI agent. So her expertise in testifying is there also, the whole package. She has fines also. So that is one of the dogs I would call on such a critical death penalty homicide because I would really want to know that those remains are there uh, because it's going to change a trial. But just think about it. If it's in somebody's backyard underneath a patio, you want a dog that's very credible. It really goes into the expertise of the handler and the dog team to make sure that they're credible for a court standard. It's amazing. It's amazing. And you know, um, Kobe, when you said, you know, sometimes people don't tell cops the truth, (laughs) this guy took the police to four different locations, right? And finally, they found Amber's remains. Now, when the police were questioned about this, because obviously it was a huge break in this case. Okay, the guy's on trial, but really for the family, it's like, please, what happened to my loved one? Where is she? Let me bury and honor her. So, um... The, the police had said um, that in two years, a lot had changed, meaning growth, just change in the area. I mean, and I don't, you know, we, we don't have that perspective. I don't have that perspective. Uh, Lewis, that would impact someone's memory, you think? Or is it because in the heat of the moment, they're just like so, you know, determined to get rid of this body that maybe they're not really paying attention? Well, I've seen that before where uh, they suspect claims that they can't remember exactly where it is it's somewhere out there and out there could encompass miles hundreds of miles of area um but i think most of the time they have a pretty good recollection of where it is they're they're playing games for lack of a better term um you have to remember he whenever a suspect especially in a homicide enters into a plea agreement a potential plea agreement where it's based you will get this benefit from the justice system if and only we find the remains, that has to go through a bunch of layers. And one of them is you really have to run that by the family, the victim's family, and see if they're willing to do that, weigh that. Because you imagine the trauma of thinking that you may never bring your loved one home. And we've had that. We've highlighted cases like this on this program, right? So I know that's part of the formula, but we also have a term for that in law enforcement when somebody wants to plea to a deal like that um, and become a police helper in solving their own case. Uh, we call that a twofer. And twofers are pretty much, you're going to get, he's going to give the information to recover and push the case further in the court system, hopefully to a guilty verdict. But part of that contract is, is they have to be 100% honest with law enforcement and can't commit any other crimes. And those are thresholds that are sometimes very impossible for these folks to achieve. So you get the benefit of finding the loved one and also this person that those t- that time that's on the shelf that's being held against him if he violates the contract comes tumbling down. Um, so I, you know, it's it's win win. But the really big wall here is to see what the family wants to do with this. Um, I, so at some point they filed the case on him and it, and, and they were going to go forward on on uh, circumstantial in evidence only. But something happened. They ran into some trouble where 
they wanted to make this offer. Now, it's interesting where, you know, obviously for him, the defendant, the accused here, of course, you know, you're facing first degree murder and they're dropping it down to second degree murder. I think that was his impetus. I think he took a look at what his future was looking like. And we haven't even gotten into his violent history yet. Um, I, I have another question. Before we get to that, though, I, Kobe, I do want to ask you this. So when she initially disappeared, right, we already had a scene where police had identified blood, had identified her leggings in the wood, uh, in the wood right? They found the receipt in the woods. All these things would have a scent themselves. And I think, you know, would like give you um, placeholders of where she had been. Um, is it just, you know, wishful thinking to have thought that maybe canines could have helped locate her remains a lot sooner? Well, I never like to Monday night quarterback is what I call it, because I don't know all the facts that the investigators were told at that time when this was happening. I do always recommend, though, on the other side, what would it hurt to have a dog there? Dogs are free. It's a mutual aid request. It's just educating and knowing what is there and available in that area. And I would have had a dog work that scene. Um and the type of dogs, it could have been tracking and trailing, area search, cadaver. Um, there's a variety of tools that could be used. But like I said, I don't know the information that was told. If somebody said that she was last seen in a car driving to New York, I mean, mm -hmm. you just don't know all the facts, then I probably right. would not have brought a dog out. So I right. don't know everything that they were told at the time. Yeah. Do Can I just add that, you know, Kobe and I have discussed this specific thing in in quite a bit uh, over the years that canines, especially bloodhounds are, are law, are a law enforcement tool that is so underused. And it, and that happens many times because law enforcement isn't aware that this tool is available to them, right? It's a very powerful, effective tool. And there are many cases out there where we would have liked to have seen it brought in sooner. So for a variety of reasons that may or may not happen, I don't know, Kobe's absolutely correct, but Kobe, what, what how far can these bloodhounds track in perfect conditions? But what are some of the lengths we're talking about uh, it, that you've seen? Personally, I have a find on a kidnapping that was three days old, over eight and a half miles, and it brought closure to a family. Oh, my Lord. So why do you, so is it, I guess most police departments don't have these dogs and therefore the police have to then reach out to what another department that has the dogs or are these people like volunteers or like how, how can we help to promote more use of canines in these situations with the ultimate goal of solving and finding people? It's really bringing the canine knowledge into the investigation schools. That would be my first step. Uh, because it's critical. The last thing you want is a volunteer who has no um, understanding of, of case law right. coming right. in on your crime scene, working their dog with the best intentions. It can go very sideways compared to informing investigators uh, the different levels of dogs and how they are usually in every county across across um, United States, but we do have like a database also. There are national organizations where um, like, for example, I'm on the board of the National Police Bloodhound Association. So if I get a call and say somebody is looking for somebody in Idaho, I will recommend off of the database where their local dog is in that state in a nearby county that they could call. And then I also know that the dog is certified. I love it. Yeah. Well, let me finish up with this case and then we'll talk more about um, Kobe's insight to, uh, you know, solving cases like this. So there was a history of domestic violence between these two. Records show a very long history, in fact. Um, and what's interesting is that um, Derek had apparently been accused and initially charged with assault charges, but they were dismissed in 2019 and amber reportedly told her mother i can't leave he won't leave me alone and we all know sadly how many of those cases we have reported on on this program 
that when someone is obsessed and determined to get you, no matter how many, you know, restraining orders, police, it's, it's awful. It is a horrible, dangerous, dangerous situation. Um, and what's so sad also is, you know, so Amber was very aware of her situation being potentially dangerous. And so was her mother. So her mother had actually taken Amber's two children in, in a protective way until Amber could get rid of this guy. And obviously she could not get rid of him. So we have tentatively ID'd Amber's remains, but all the DNA testing is being done now. The medical examiner will determine the cause of death and everything else. So there's much more information to come on this. Back to the case and what's going on with Derek Horton. So he will be pleading guilty to second degree murder, which has a minimum sentence of 15 years. As you said, Lewis, the family had to agree that this was going to be the punishment that they would agree to. Of course, it's not completely um, decided yet. And we will follow exactly what he ends up with at sentencing. So it, it, there- It's so sad that that's all he's looking at. I, I get it, but when you weigh it, that's just, those numbers just seem so off, but they made, gave some comfort to the family. It's just hard to see their perspective unless you're right there, but- I know. I, I see it all the time. It's so sad, but sometimes that's what you have to do. Well, it's the minimum, so maybe he'll get more, right? Yeah. Maybe he'll get more. So, Kobe, now I want to talk a lot more about about you <laughs> and about what you do. So I, I said a few minutes ago that you almost didn't survive. You were in a horrific car accident with your two twin babies in the car in their car seats. They were unscathed, but you, you were seriously injured. You were left partially paralyzed. It was a blessing. Um, it, it really was. I take the impact any day over my children uh, being injured, but it's just like those videos you see with the black eyes. We were one of those vehicles on black ice and um, it was just very sad, um, a hard day, but I was so thankful that I was the worst out of everybody injured. And that, and of course, I had to direct the scene. I, I stayed conscious, uh, waited for the helicopter. I made two phone calls, called my uh, my dad and then uh, called the department. Um, and then I made the helicopter pilot call my parents and tell them which <laughs> trauma center I was going to. And then once I made it to the um, emergency room is where I went into cardiac arrest. But I am now bionic. Yes. And um, I tell my kids, um, one thing is, is, um, we always stay positive. We're appreciative and you should always be giving back and you can overcome anything. If you surround yourself with good people willing to help you paddle, uh, it's amazing what humanity will do when, uh, you just simply ask for help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But uh you have to have the positive attitude and the mindset, uh, that is key. If you start feeling bad for yourself, I always said, you know, you, there's a fork in the road, Ryan. I could go down the dark road and say, why me? And lay in this bed and get the bed sores because yes, I, I broke my back. I'm an L1 burst and I'm an L1 paraplegia, but I walk, uh, but you could go down that dark road and I had the body brace, everything. And, or you go down the other road where you flip a UE that down that dark road and you go down the other one, you have nothing to lose to go try to work out, to ask physical therapists and doctors and say, yeah, what can I do? Just tell me what I need to do. And they would be like 20 minutes in the standing frame. I'd go, no, we're doing 40. Leave me here. I don't care if I'm crying, suck it up. I just need your help. And they were like, wow, if we could get everybody like that, It'd be amazing what they can do. So um, I made it and I made it back to work um, and I was able to still give, which is what my purpose was. It wasn't um, just to shut down and be retired.
And what I, I love about Kobe is that um, you ended up, obviously, because of your injuries, you couldn't, you know, you had to have more of a, a desk job, if you will. And you end up, I remember you telling me the story, and I, I can, I tell it to every person I meet. I tell them about you and Arthur the dog, right? Mm-hmm. Arthur is his name. I'm like, I've never met Arthur. I love Arthur. So, Kobe, you're working at um, the morgue. And that is like a coroner's office, right? Excuse me, the coroner's mm-hmm. office. And that is a very tough and sad place. And you get this call from what? Seeing eye dogs of the desert about this sweet dog named Arthur who just flunked his exams and will not, you know, be able to be a full service dog. And they're like, Kobe, can you help us with Arthur? And you take Arthur in and you find a job for him at the coroner's office. That's yeah. So I've been working with um, organizations like with um, diabetic alert dogs and guide dogs. And I had always wanted the high strung dogs that we could train into narcotics or explosives. And instead, I got the call of we have Arthur and Arthur uh, will bark when he has to go to the bathroom. And I was like, well, I love that. (laughs) And they said, um, so he's not making in our program. Can you find a career change for him? And and I was sure, why not? So I had Arthur and yeah, he definitely was not going to be explosive or narcotics dog. He was like, okay, I'm done with my ball after 10 minutes. (laughs) So that wasn't his thing. And then um, I remember I was sitting home on a Sunday and I'm watching him because he was so obedient and so well behaved. And then I was dealing with at work we had um, two CHP officers killed in the line of duty in Riverside County at the time. One was hit by a DUI driver and then one was in a shooting in Marina Valley. And my people, my death investigators had already known these officers from working traffic collisions together. And I was watching how they said every day is a bad day. Every day here, somebody dies and we have to notify a family. And then when we know the people, we have to suck it up. And I kind of like went, wow, if something happened and I was out in the community and I just lost my loved one and knowing that you're shattered yourself and you're going to come and break this news to me, if you're not mentally well, how's that delivery coming? And are you really vested? Are you in survival mode? And so I was already trying to think outside the box and how to help uh, my people. And when I brought in like the chaplain, they knew they went talk on duty. They're like, Oh, it's the chaplain. I'm not talking. I I'll talk to you later. A very, but there was nothing to get them through the day. And that's when um, I was a commander and I knew um, I was going to be retiring within a year and a half. And so I really um, did it the Kobe way of Arthur's coming And I'm just letting you all know, and I need you to all jump on this bandwagon with me. And I brought him in and everybody loved him. Everybody could walk him. Um, It was so phenomenal that it was people that I didn't even think about, like um, the forensic pathologist. Nobody ever thinks about those doctors back there doing the autopsies when it's a baby case. Oh, it affects them. It affects them Um, when they see brutal crimes. And they're, they're doing it because they're speaking for the silent victims is what yes. they call it. And they're doing it, but nobody thinks of the mental wellness for them. And then my accounting, um, I had one of my accounting technicians pull her retirement papers for Arthur because she said, have you ever seen an officer upset? You can see them upset when their paycheck is wrong and their overtime is not on there. And she goes, and it's a really bad day. And I went, wow, I never even thought about it. And it grew so well where uh, the sheriff, everybody supported me. And I had to get HR, safety, risk management. And I just took Arthur everywhere. And they were like, this is the greatest guy. And I'm like, I know. Um, And it grew to the point where I never saw Arthur at work. I'd bring him and he'd be gone for the day. Everybody would be out walking but nobody abused it. It would get you away from your console, your last call. You would go outside, take Arthur. You had a purpose to go outside and get fresh air. And here's a dog that's so happy to see you every day and that you're taking him for a walk. 
Next thing I know, he's getting Amazon packages delivered to the <laughs> coroner's bureau. And he just was phenomenal where it grew, where I placed um, dogs in both of our dispatch centers, because Amazing. that's another group of people that are a lot of times forgotten when you're yes. taking those 911 calls. And even on this case, we talked about it. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine that dispatcher hearing her fighting for her life? And then that phone goes dead. And then now it's a homicide. Could they, that, that affects them. And so to have a dog there, when you walk in and you're handling this, it gives you a chance to walk away from that console and just be with an animal that's happy, not judging you and will give you a hug. And that's where it's really grown. So they're ready for the next 911 call. The amazing thing, Kobe, is that you ended up, you know, really writing the protocol, which would be accepted by police departments, right? So you did everything by the books, even though it was Kobe's way, right? (laughs) Sometimes you got to rewrite that book. (laughs) And so you've set up the protocol. You now have a program which is unbelievable. And and you work with Lewis where you are, now people know, especially in all these organizations, if they have a service dog that is fantastic, is great, but doesn't you know, make the final cut. And Lewis knows I have a personal story about that, 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 you know, they get a second chance through you because you will retrain them and repurpose them, give them, rehire them, find them a new job, which is, I love the way you say that. And now you, I mean, your organization and Lewis helps with this, you are placing dogs in police departments and, and you've made a lot of headlines because you have now placed two dogs at the Capitol Police Department. They have suffered terribly there. And you've sent, is it Lila or Lola? It was Lila and Lila needed a change of career because Lila liked to chase squirrels. So she was not gonna be a good guide dog. Could you imagine guiding somebody (laughs) and there's a squirrel? But she fit perfect in our program. And it was actually Lewis that called me. He called me and said, okay, I see what you're doing. I know what you're doing. This needs to get out there. You're doing this all on your own. It's all you. And what do you need? And I I was like, Lewis, this is so big. I have so many ideas. And he's like, we're going to help you. That We're going to help you. And he introduced me to Angela Rose. And once she she understood what my mission was with mental wellness for officers because of her own case of that first interview with an officer not believing her. And just for those of you who may not know, um, Lewis is an ambassador for PAVE. PAVE is uh, a nonprofit that works for survivors of sexual assault and victims' rights. And so um, it's your dogs now are kind of under the auspices of PAVE in trying to get the dogs in, whether it's for mental health, right? Or whether it's for someone who has just um, been a a vicious victim of a crime and needs support in the interview room. Am I saying that correctly? Correct. The dogs, um, the policy that I wrote there, it's adaptable to whatever the agency needs. So if an agency needs it for mental wellness, like, for example, Capitol Police, it's something positive. It comes in. The dog does not care what political party you are, does not. The dog doesn't vote, doesn't care how you voted. The dog is just happy to see you and wants to be part of your team. The dog is there on the good days and the bad days. So there's nothing, no stigma that um, you need help. It's just a tool to help you through the day. And then the victims, that's longer lasting also. Because that interview, to have a dog not judging you and just wants to sit with you knowing you're having a bad day and have to talk about something and get those details, it's so calming that that agency can even have that dog follow that victim through their whole court process. It's amazing um, that we're caring about people uh, and it's irreplaceable. Again, I've always said a dog is an irreplaceable asset. It's just, how do you utilize them? And in the case of Lila and the um, 
Capitol Police Department, you said how they'd had deaths and suicides recently. How how many? I mean, it, it's a traumatized department. Yes. Um, the first dog, Lila, I delivered actually on July 4th. And at that time, they had uh, four suicides since January 6th. And then they had, of course, the officers killed in the line of duty. And when we showed up, I took my son with me. Um, those twins that were in the car accident, they travel everywhere with me. And they're part of this. They see what we're doing. And they actually helped me train the dogs. And I took um, my son to the Capitol because what an opportunity to see what we do at home training and the delivery and to see that. And when we arrived, um, it was when... It, It was July 4th, so they had their emergency response teams out in case of any protests. And we had guys in full SWAT suits taking off their helmets, hugging Lila. We had only been there for 20 minutes. I'm going to start crying. (laughs) And they're doing selfies with this dog. And they're like, this made my whole night that I'm working July 4th because I get to meet Lila first. And my son got to see that to go, look at how they're making us safe and look at what we're doing and look how we just made somebody's day. Mm -hmm. And that is part of it um, where, like I said, now they have two dogs. There's nothing negative about it. They're there. There's not one thing negative about a career change for these dogs because that's what, and I do call them the smarter ones. Because here's a service dog and they help that one individual and that's wonderful. Their purpose, outstanding. But I kind of laughed at the ones that go, no, this isn't for me. I need to go over to Kobe's program where everybody loves me Mm -hmm. and I get to um, be part of a team and help more people. I kind of joke, I'm like, okay, you guys must have doggy talk and you guys are the smart ones because They've just been phenomenal. They're helping more than one individual. They're helping. It's the communities. I love what you do. Honestly, I am. I know Lewis is your hugest fan, you know, and I'm, I'm back there with a bunch of other people cheering you on because I just, I love your spirit. I love the fact that, you know, you've been given a second chance and you see these fabulous, fabulous dogs and you give them a second chance. And that's what I love about life is the second chances. I love it. So now I do want to make sure that we talk about one more thing and it's called your find him scent safe. What, what is that? What, what, what is that? Well, so basically what my idea was, um, a lot of people are very familiar with the fingerprint kits. Um, most parents will do the fingerprint kit of their child and, um, we save them, we put them in our safes. Uh, we take a picture of our child. We'll put a piece of hair in there. And that always bothered me. Um, That's to identify. And I never liked that. I don't want to identify somebody. Rather, I was always into finding people, which is the bloodhounds. I want to find you before I'm working a homicide. And so why not tell families what the dog needs to be successful? We do it on crime scenes. On crime scenes, we'll preserve it. We will go in and we will collect scent and track bad guys. And it holds in death penalty homicides. But we don't tell families, hey, if you have somebody that has autism, dementia, or a child autistic, you need to collect their scent and stick it in your freezer. And it needs to be on a sterile gauze pad where it doesn't have the parent's scent. It's solely of that one person's scent you stick it in the freezer and then if anybody goes missing you give it to the dog team and now you just gave the dog team the best tool to help locate and that was my idea because like i said it was great working the criminal cases and was great giving families closure but the cases that really bothered me when i went home in the evening were the ones i couldn't find and i did it usually that's the missing because if your child goes missing Mom always handed me the sin item and that always messed up my dog because why mom, you're living there in the house. How many trails are you laying? You walk out, you check the mail, you drive to the store. You're putting a humongous hurdle against my dog. My dog needs the one scent, like how we do our crime scenes. We preserve, we save it. Not everybody's entering the house. 
and I get pristine scent and I could track that one individual, but I couldn't do it on missing because it was never treated like evidence. So we and, always think, because we see this like in the TV shows and the movies, it's like, oh, you just give them the kid's sweatshirt or pajamas or the, or the teddy bear. Case right, and, right, right. But that's not good really, enough. No, it really messes them up because like I kiss my kids goodnight. So I lean over the pillowcase. I also do the laundry and I, I put it in their rooms. My scent is everywhere in this house. And me having twins especially was how do I have scent of just them? and preserve it for them because i could take scent if they're out um out hiking or if they're with the boy scouts anything i could take the scent to where they were last seen and i can instantly have a dog start tracking them so how does one get one of these kits like all of a sudden you know we all are in a panic as parents it's like oh my god i don't have my kids scent so so where do i get this <laughs> so it's at find them scent safe um, and also, even the easiest way to really get it is um, going through Webb's canine training. Um, you're reaching out to me. There's no employees. It's right to me. Uh, this is why I'm retired from law enforcement, because I want to help families. And I could do it greater now that I've done my years. And it's like, here you go. Here's a safe. Collect the scent and stick it in your freezer, just like evidence. And if your loved one ever goes missing, you're giving first responders, you're also giving those investigators, remember how we were talking earlier, a ding, ding, ding to call a dog. Right. right. And oh. that, it, it was a win-win for me to kind of get everybody on board and utilize a dog and at least get direction of travel. Could you imagine if a car is parked at a hiking trail and we bring in a tracking dog and it just gives us direction of travel, the helicopter can move there. The resources can move in that direction. Instead of 360 degrees, you're just saving us time to find your loved one quicker. Wow, oh my gosh, you have just been such an inspiration. Um, I love this, I love what you do. I just, I think you're amazing. Kobe, I hope that you will come back and um, I'd love you to be part of our extended crime family to help us with cases and, and just help people. Absolutely. I'll tell you where a dog is in a heartbeat. Because <laughs> I want dogs used. And I want families to have closure or find them. I don't want them identified. I, I don't want that. I love that. Kobe, thank you so much. Lewis, thank you as always. You. Um, I can see why the two of you were such a great team and still are. All right. So, Kobe, if people want to find out more about you, find out where to get these scent kits or anything like that, w where can they find you? Either website, social media? The easiest is webscaninetraining.com. Uh, there's a link there where you can email me directly and I can help investigators or loved ones, um, whatever they need, I'm available. And where can they get this kit if they need it? They can just, it's the same thing. If you go to uh, find them scent safes, uh, you can order a kit that way. Um, it's a little bit easier just to do the one link and you, it goes to the same place. Terrific, and Lewis, where can people find you? Thanks, Anna, thank you, Kobe. Wow. Um, my entire social media footprint is at getbitinvestigations.com. And I'm Anna G News everywhere. Uh, also want to say thank you to HelloFresh for supporting this podcast. We are very appreciative. You can find all of our episodes of True Crime Daily wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to check out a special interview that I did with um, FBI profiler John Douglas. He is the inspiration and the cases and the story and the man behind Mine Hunter and Silence of the Lambs. Um, it's all based on John's life. I did a special interview with him on the My Favorite Case series. So um, that's the other podcast that we do here. Please check it out. He's fascinating. I want to take John Douglas, Dr. Kobe Webb, Louis Bolaños, and I want to come up with a super team. <laughs> A super team of crime fighters and solvers. Uh, subscribe, of course, to True Crime Daily's YouTube channel. And, you know, you know what we always say. I'm Anna Garcia, your host. And as we always say, don't do crime.